Uh, I don't know if you've been reading the news lately. There's lots of things in the news that often make me want to look away. Uh, but as we, um, as I woke up this morning, yesterday, brokenhearted anyway, many times recently, thinking back to the Garlic Festival in California uh, yesterday in El Paso, Texas, and then waking up this morning to see what's going on in Dayton, Ohio, uh, it's just heartbreaking, right? It's just heartbreaking. It's not right. There's something in us that raises up and just says, this is not good. For whatever information continues to come out about it, for whatever political angles people try to take with this, whatever stances people have, no matter what, there's hurt, right? There's just hurt. There's loss. It's not supposed to go that way. It's not right. No matter why, no matter how, it's not right. And so uh, as the church, it's good for us to just take a minute uh, and ask God to intercede on their behalf and ask God if there's anything that any of us can do to intercede on their or anyone else's behalf. We're no stranger to, strat- uh, to tragedy here in Las Vegas, are we? Uh, and so this sense of, of, of relating a little bit to what's going on uh, matters, and we should respond to it. So I thought we should just begin uh, this kind of piece of our, our, our church today to, to spend a minute praying for families. Can we do that for just a minute? I'm going to give you uh, like 20 or 30 seconds just to pray on your own, because I think sometimes we just listen to somebody in a microphone. Let's just all lift up our hearts to God and, uh, and reach out to those folks and, and pray for some healing, some restoration, for a way forward and for this nonsense to stop, okay? Let's pray and then I'll, I'll close us up here in a second. Uh, and so, God, I, I, want to, uh, I want to say thank you that there's a day coming when all of, of this will stop uh, and that you'll make everything right. And, God, I just pray that uh, between here and there that people would come alive in you to spend this life with you and spend forever with you. God, I pray for each and every family, each and every friend, each and every city and community Touched by this, God, that you would bring healing and that your church, your people would step in selflessly in a way to give and give and give to show how much you love people, God. God, help us be people who love people really, really well. If there's a role for us to play, God, help us see it. Uh, In the meantime, at least, we'll pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, as, uh, as Mitch said, we have been in a series uh, that we call Selfless, this idea of sharing with people in need. And so I just want to kind of relocate us real quick to try to land in where we're going to spend some time today. Uh, we've been saying this year, 2019, that we just want to be people who fix our eyes on Jesus, right? Out of Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, we've set the whole year kind of built around this thing with this hope and dream that Jesus is constantly on our mind and on our lips because we believe here at Canyon Ridge that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he's rescued us, and we get to spend our whole life saying thank you to him. And as we do that, our lives fill up and go in the best directions possible, so we're fixing our eyes on him. We've been looking at almost every single one of our teachings this year has been out of the life of Jesus, these books in the Bible called the Gospels. Uh, And you cannot look at the Gospels. You cannot look at the life of Jesus and miss, in any way miss, how closely tied caring for Jesus and caring for people in need really is. That Jesus almost doesn't see those two things as different. In fact, when someone asked Jesus, what's the most important thing we should know? Do you remember what he said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, what else? And love your neighbor as yourself. He called those one command. Can't even separate them. Inseparably tied is this idea that we would care for those who have needs, and that somehow is wrapped up completely in caring for Jesus. In fact, I'm going to show you a scripture where he makes that abundantly clear in Matthew chapter 25 here in just a little bit. And so if that's what Jesus is like, that's what we want to be like. We want to live in his direction, be shaped by him. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the why of how we do that. We move out of scarcity into into having enough and then having more than enough and what we do with that. Last week we realized there's us, there's just us, there's not them, there's just us. 
and there's some of us who are in need, and there's some of us who have, and if we can take what we have and share with those in need, God has great things in store for us, joy and peace, and I thought maybe we should just celebrate one thing, because we want to be a church that celebrates. Uh, Here's a cool picture. Check this out. This is not a person who went to Target and bought clothes, okay? This is a person who has been dreaming of the day when they are able to foster some kids in their home. And so as their kids grow up, they've been keeping all of the clothes that they've outgrown to be ready for the day they can bring some foster kids into their house. But this isn't the season yet for them to foster, and so they said, you know what? These clothes could be way better used in people who are fostering kids right now. So they loaded up their van, and the whole back seat looks like this too, and took these to Foster Connect, and these folks, uh, there's a store set up for foster families to go in and get what they need, and so that store just got blasted with these people's clothes, which is awesome. I love it. You know why I love it? You might not know why I love it. I love that you clap. You guys are clappy today. I like it. Uh, Here's why I love it. Because this means that this family who gave all of that away will now have to and get to live in peace that God will provide at just the right time. They get the joy of dropping that off and imagining the faces on the families who show up and get just what they need and just their size and their favorite look and favorite color in a way maybe they hadn't imagined. And they get the joy of receiving when God provides for their family at just the right time when foster kids come into there. God has the best plans, I'm just telling you. I know people think that that receiving is better than giving, but I think Jesus is right when he says that giving is better than receiving. There's joy and there's peace in it. So we do this, right? It's so good. Now... Here's the thing, today I'm not gonna talk a lot about why we give. I'm going to almost assume that you're on board, okay? We're gonna go right to the how today and get past the why, which is dangerous because we never wanna confuse the two. Jesus is always about our heart and shaping the deepest parts of who we are. So we always start with why, right? Our motivation matters as much, it should drive our action. So don't get confused today as we talk about action thinking that's the starting point, okay? That's not it. It comes out of this motivation that Jesus gives us. But I can't do it all the way, so i got to give you one quick why. We're going to spend about three minutes doing this. Are you ready? I want you to think of someone who loves you, okay? Just think of a couple people that you know they love you, okay? Call their names to mind, all right? And then what I'd love for you to think about for a second is how do you know? How do you know they love you? In fact, take just a second and tell the person next to you. Don't tell them their name, just say, how do you know that person loves you? Tell them right now, go. Okay, I have no idea what you said, but y'all sound very smart. And the people who laugh, I just wish I was sitting next to you. That sounds fun. (laughs) But here's the deal. I am betting that 90 plus percent of everything that you said had something to do with their actions. Am I right? Because here's the deal. Our heart is revealed in our actions. You can say all day that you love someone, but you, you, nope, 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 nope. Say what you want until it comes out in action. It's not real, right? Right, our heart reveals, is revealed by our action. Okay, so here's what we say all the time here at church, and, and those of us who follow Jesus, we believe this to our toes. Jesus loves you. Like, even you, yep, you, and you, and you, and you over there, no matter where you come from, no matter where you've been, no matter what you look like, no matter what your age is, your history, doesn't matter. Whatever you're even doing with your life right now, whether you acknowledge him, believe him or not, he loves you. All right, now some of us in here are followers of Jesus, okay? So here's what I'd like for us to do. I'd like for just to take just a second, especially those of you who follow Jesus, and especially for those of you in here who might not follow Jesus yet. By the way, you can belong here before you believe. You don't need to agree with us on everything. We don't agree on everything. You have a place here, okay? But for those of us who follow Jesus, I would love for you to turn to the person next to you or turn to someone around you and tell them, how do you know? How do you know Jesus loves you, okay? Tell the person next to you, go. Now, I don't know what you said here, but y'all are preachers, that's good, right? This is the good news, right? That Peter says that we should be prepared to have an answer. And here's why I know that Jesus loves me, because he gave his life for me, period. Action, 
He gave, he gave, he gave, he gave. Not only did he give up heaven and put on flesh and come and walk among us, grow as a child and learn obedience, Hebrews says, 30 years of being obedient and serving and working and doing all the things that a Jew in the first century would do, and at 30 years old, entering the public eyes, proclaiming what God had said, teaching us the best way to live so that we can look at it all the time and know what God is like. When we had no idea how to wrap our minds around God, Jesus showed up and said, I am the perfect image of God. Look at me. You will see what God is like because Jesus was God. And so he walked, but then, but then, but then, but then, even though he had never, 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 ever, 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 ever failed, he gave his life for us so that all of our failure would be paid for and nothing would ever separate us from God. He gave. He acted. His actions reveal his heart. And on the third day, he walked out of the grave so that the Holy Spirit could move into our lives and show us that our life will never end, and there will be a day when we spend forever with God exactly as we were always intended to be, that we'll never, ever, ever have to live a second separate from him. He loves us. His heart is revealed by his actions, and because of that heart, that's why we respond in living the way that he lived. It's the best way to live. It's the only way to live, in gratitude for what he has done, and so we fix our eyes on Jesus. Now here's this beautiful thing that Jesus teaches us, is that not only do our our actions reveal our heart, but consistent actions can shape our heart, right? And so that's where this whole sharing thing comes in. If we're gonna look like Jesus and be selfless and give like Jesus, then some consistent action can shape that, and so we share. So here's the question today, how do we share? What does Jesus say about how we share with people who are in need? When we find ourselves in a situation where we have more than we need, how do we share with people in need? And the first answer, well, here's the big idea. We become more selfless like Jesus when we share with others. This action of sharing, the consistent action of sharing, will shape our hearts and make us more selfless, and we become more like Jesus. We experience that joy and peace that we talked about. So we head off in that direction on purpose with some discipline. But uh, you know what? You've heard the saying that practice makes what? Well, coaches know this, perfect practice makes perfect, right? So you gotta practice well if you're gonna get perfect, right? So you're right, practice makes perfect, but a specific kind. And so today is about, okay, what does good practice look like to shape our hearts? And the first one is this, is that we give based on need and not based on status, just like Jesus did. Hey, what was our status when Jesus rescued us? A hot mess, everybody, just in case you missed it. Right, some of us, we still look like it, you're probably right in some ways, okay? But here's the thing, it was not because of our beauty or our worth or anything else that Jesus rescued us, it was because of his love and our need that he stepped in. Not because we could elevate his status or because we had some sort of status. We give based on need, not based on status. Uh, You can see this, I encourage you to check this out in Luke chapter 14, I'll share just a little bit of it. But Jesus goes through this little teaching at a banquet. He was at a banquet, and in the first century, banquets were all about status. In fact, the seating arrangement was like choosing kids at kickball in grade school, best to worst. You know what I'm saying? The the, the, the most important people would sit next to the host and all the way around the table. And so he does this teaching having to do with status, and he says, listen, don't try to achieve status. Take a low seat and let people elevate you. Let other people lift you up. Bring yourself into humility, Jesus says. Uh, Then he goes on this thing and he says, let me, just, uh, let me just wreck your view of status while I'm at it. Jesus says, let me teach you what I think of status. In Luke chapter 14, he says this in verse 12. He turned to the host of the party. By the way, the host would have invited people who were a little higher in status and maybe a click below just so he looks generous. That's kind of how this culture worked. Not that our culture is at all caught up in status or appearance or hierarchies or anything like that, but Jesus was, so just try to translate if you can. Jesus turned to the host and he said, you know what, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that'll be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, invite the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting who? Those who could not repay you. See, it's not about status. It's not about the the dinner, the party thrower looking good because of the people who he invited, either because it makes him look generous or associates him with popular or, or more important people of greater status. 
Jesus says, no, 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 no. I know you're focusing on kind of the rungs above and below you on the ladder, but why don't you just find your way to the bottom? Because this is where we provide for those in need. He says, don't get caught up in status. Provide based on need. And so in a culture that constantly encourages us to look at status instead as followers of Jesus, if we're really going to experience and become more and more like Jesus, we don't look for status. we got to look past status. We've got to stop classifying and quantifying people and just see people. There's no them. There's just us. There's us who are in need. And Jesus says, listen, when you're going to give, when you're going to share, find people in need. Now, I don't know about you how many banquets or luncheons you throw. I'm not a big luncheon thrower, personally. Uh, I would, but you, I don't know if you like ham sandwiches, but that's what you would get. (laughs) But there are ways in this culture that was one of the ways to show value to people. To do one of these required weeks of planning. It often required two rounds of invitations, which is about another passage you would see there in Luke 14. It was a big deal. It it required cost. It required consideration, preparation, investment of time and money. Jesus is saying, look, 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 don't spend all your time and money and investment and thought and consideration and emotion just in your status. He says, no, 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 no. Stop looking at status and look for need. So when we give, we give like Jesus. He gave to us in need, not us who had status. And so as those who bear his name, we give based on need, not on status. Round two, you ready? We don't give uh, as a loan, we give as a gift. When we give, we give gifts, not loans, like Jesus. Now, what's the difference between a gift and a loan? When you, uh, when you are given a gift, what's the expectation? What, what, what should that person do? Nothing, or say, thank you, right? That's very simple. When you give someone a loan, there's a little different expectation, right? A little bit different. You go to the bank, you get a loan. Are they looking for a thank you note? <laughs> no. What are they looking for? And what are they looking with the court's help if necessary? <laughs> They're looking for payment, right? So here's the deal. These are very different things. Now, we don't always do that, but we kind of do that. We keep score when we give. It, Jesus says, no, no, no. Give as a gift, not as a loan. This can be happening with our words, this can be happening with stuff, this can happen with uh, our money. The world operates on a quid pro quo, right? That when we offer something to someone, we're gonna expect something in return. In fact, sometimes, I don't know if you're like this, but sometimes I'm hesitant to receive something because I'm looking for the angle. Why are you gonna give me something? There's gotta be something you want in return. There's gotta be like a switch on the other side, right? And Jesus says, no, no, no. In my family, when we give, we give gifts. And here's what I love about Jesus. You know what? There's actually two things you should do with a gift, or at least there's two things that Jesus hopes for a gift. I bet you do too. You know what it is? Hope you say thank you, because gratitude produces joy. And you know what else he hopes for? It's what I hope for when I give a gift, is that they really, really, really enjoy it. And so that's the way Jesus gives. He gives us life so that we can say thank you and enjoy life with him. Right? In the same way, we give that kind of gift. And so he teaches this pretty directly in Luke chapter 6. He says it this way in verses 34 and 35. If you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners, now careful with the label, sinner just means someone who does the opposite of what God wants. Right? So people who live outside of this awesome life that God has invited us into. Right? The people who don't do what God wants will lend their money to other people who don't do what God wants for a full return. Like, there's nothing special in that. Jesus says, no, 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 we're going to be different. In fact, this whole sermon in Luke chapter 6 is about how his followers are different. He says, no, 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 we don't just love people who love us back, verse 35 says. It says, love your enemies and do, which is an action word, do good to them. Not wish good to them, not say good to them, do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. You will be truly acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those even who are unthankful and wicked. He's kind, no matter what people's response is. And so we give to those in need, no matter what their response is, not expecting repayment. Verse 36, you must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. 
Now, I don't know how many of you grew up with siblings or you uh, have parents or you are parents, but in our family, there are moments that come around where a child in our family will do something and my wife and I will make eye contact and it is very clear that one of us is saying, that's your fault. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like uh, when one of my sons who is hyper competitive throws elbows because he's insistent on getting through the Walmart door first, my wife looks at me like, oh yeah, that's all you. Mm -hmm. Because he's my kid, right? That's how it came about. What Jesus is saying is, Listen, when you do this kind of life, when you are kind and compassionate, people should look at you and say, yeah, that's God's fault. God did that. That's because they're God's kid. That our giving and our generosity in ways that expect nothing in return are a reflection of God and show the world who God is. In fact, it's awesome when people start looking for strings and you get to genuinely say there are no strings. It's just a gift. Just say thank you. It's so good that we follow in his, in fact, I love this word compassion. It's a perfect blend of what we're talking about, heart and action. Compassion is this thing that something in you moves and it's like, oh, this, I, I gotta do something and you're driven to action. It's the kind of people that God is shaping us to be. He says, be compassionate. Then, just like your father in heaven is compassionate. So listen, we, we give based on need, not on status, and we give as a gift and not a loan, and here's what we expect. All right? We expect a reward, not repayment. We expect a reward, not a repayment. We don't want to be paid back. This is not a loan. This is a gift. But we can expect a reward. If you were listening to both of the scriptures that we read off of the screens, you saw that there was reward in both of those things. Right? And, and he says, don't settle for lousy rewards. In fact, in Matthew 6, he says, when you give, not if you give, but when you give, don't do it and make a big show of it so people look at you, then you've gotten your reward. Or don't just invite people who can pay you back because then you've gotten your reward. But he does promise a reward in both of these. He says, God will reward you, and your reward will be in heaven, the second passage says. We should expect a reward. Part of that reward is the joy and the peace that we experience in living as children of God that we've talked about last week. We've already talked about it some today. But that's not it. There's a much, much, much bigger reward that every time we give, it points toward the reward that we'll receive. It's just not now. You see, there's coming a day when Jesus will return and he will set everything right. And we'll read a scripture about this here in a few minutes, Matthew chapter 25. And God will invite all of us who have lived with him in this life to live in the next life with him forever. And all of us who didn't want anything to do with God in this life can have nothing to do with God in the next life. And he puts us in two categories. And all of us who have wanted everything to do with him in this life, he will reward us in full for all that we have done in his name. There is a reward coming, it's just not now. It's forward. In fact, it was the same for Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12. He says that we should fix our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, but then sat down at the right hand of the Father. Or let me share with my favorite passage about Jesus' reward, y'all ready? Philippians chapter two. This is a song, probably a, a hymn that the church would have sang in the first century. I love this, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Just soak it in, ready? Philippians chapter two, verse three. He's ta talking to us, and he says, listen, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. You hear status? Be humble, right? Lower yourself. Thinking of others as better than yourselves, lifting others up. Don't look out after your, only after your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Right? It's always both. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's always both. But then we get into this. Verse 5, you must have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Now soak this in, verse five, or verse 6. Though he was God, top of the ladder. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up. Instead of clinging, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And therefore, anytime you see a therefore, you should ask yourself, what's a therefore, therefore, okay? Because of all that stuff before. Therefore, God elevated him. Jesus lowered himself. But God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory 
of the Father. You see, there's a reward coming. And here's what I want you to catch. This is subtle, but please don't miss it. It's so important. It changed my week. Are you ready? Every time we give, there's something in us that expects something in return. And what Jesus invites us to do is to take that expectation and allow it to point us to the day that Jesus returns. Every time we give, we have a chance to think about the day Jesus makes it all right. In fact, Martin Luther, a church reformer in the 16th century, said it this way, I have two days on my calendar, this day and that day. The day that we get to live in obedience to God and in his presence right now, and the day that begins forever. It's when we get caught up on all the days in between and worrying and grappling and controlling and all those things, we get all messed up. Luther says this day and that day. Every time we give, the fear and the things that crop up or the expectation of return, we get to step into that and say, this is a trigger now to point me to the day Jesus comes back. Because our hope is not just for today, it's for that day. Every gift is an opportunity. Every time we share, it's an opportunity. So, you're all on board, right? Okay, so I want you to turn to the person next to you, and you're going to preach again. Y'all ready? Y'all going to be preachers for just a minute. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you should share. Okay, go. You can even wave a finger if you want. Okay, cool. Good job. Now that you got your finger all warmed up, I just want you to look to the person next to you, find your favorite person that you looked at, and then uh, and I say, I'm going to share Oh, now your enthusiasm's gone. I see how it is. Uh Uh-huh. I see you. So listen, we talked about why to share. We talked about how to share. So you know what time time it is? Time to share. So let's share. Now, where do we start? Who should we start with? Now, this is a little backwards for me. This is a little unnerving for me, but I'm going to share it with you really quickly because Jesus says it. Y'all ready? You know who we should share with first? Jesus' people. We should share with Jesus' people first. Why? Well, let me show you. Matthew chapter 25. Y'all ready? Matthew chapter 25, famous passage about giving. Famous passage about giving. Uh, 25 verse 31, it says this. When the Son of Man, which is Jesus, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon the glorious throne. It's what we just read about in Philippians 2, right? Jesus returns. Everybody comes around. All the nations, not some of the nations, not the good nations, not all the nations, everyone will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the uh, people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And the Middle East, sheep and goats look a lot alike. One has the tail goes up, one has the tail goes down. You don't care. But here's the thing. They split them into two groups, okay? And he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats on his left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed, By my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. Is that is that an emotion or an action? By the way, it's an action. You fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you? Hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing. When do we ever see you sick in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did this to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you hear Jesus' people? When you did one of these to the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, least of, me is, least of these meaning those in need, when you did something for those in need in my family, you were doing it to me. Do you see how inseparably tied caring for those in need is with caring for Jesus himself? What's surprising to the righteous people who spend forever with Jesus, Jesus had promised it, so they weren't surprised to spend forever with him. What's surprising is how well they had cared for him because he tied up their care for him with the care for his people. Parents, you get this, right? When someone takes care of your kids, who are they really caring for? They're caring for you too, right? Jesus says the exact same thing. He says, start with my people. In fact, Jesus said it this way in in, uh, John chapter 13. He says, they will know you are my followers by what? The love you have for one another. How is love, how do you actually know someone loves you? Action. Because action reveals heart. 
We give, we share, and we share first with those people in need. Now, here's what we said, is that our action reveals our heart, but what if we wanna change our heart? The way to change our heart is consistent action. So let's ask this simple question. If we wanna change our heart and have consistent action giving to other believers in Jesus, how do we do that? How do we do it? Well, one way we did it last week is we gave a bunch of backpacks too, right? 847 of them, pretty awesome, right? That's pretty sweet. People are becoming more selfish, they're taking action, right? And so we can do some things in Jesus' name. Now, there's this other way that we're doing it this weekend. This is just one of the ways we do it at church, not the only way to do it at all. We give via compassion and we sponsor kids every single month, consistent action. Perfect practice makes perfect. We give consistently so that people can come alive in Jesus, so the church is fueled in the, in the country of Bolivia, so that children are lifted up out of poverty and generations of a family are changed. We do it consistently. That's why we collect offering every single week, because we as followers of Jesus believe that our consistent giving consistently shapes our heart. And so we do that all the time. We do this with discipline. We give regularity because perfect practice makes perfect. You know what else we should do? so that we're in really great, consistent habit of caring for Jesus' people? We should spend consistent time with some of Jesus' people. It's why around here we're crazy about this idea called life groups. Not because they're the end all be all, not because they're easy, not because it always works the first time, but because we believe every single one of us should live in close relationship with other people who follow Jesus. People who annoy us, people who need us, people who encourage us, people who give to us, we live in these things called great friendships having to do with Jesus. Because in that context, we get close enough to see people's needs, and they get close enough to see ours. And we do what Jesus has said, by caring for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. You gotta have brothers and sisters to take care of them, so we get together in groups. Kind of like my life group. Uh, It was December 23rd, I think. When my washer or when my washing machine died. And let me tell you, with six people in a family, it's a lot of dirty clothes, okay? Four days later, I was supposed to have a heart catheterization because it seemed like I was about to die of a heart attack. Turns out I almost was. And so I was going for a heart catheterization. But he texts me, How's your day going? Super lousy, man. My washing machine just broke. It's the last thing I need to worry about when my heart's already broke, okay? And so two days later, I get a text. From him. He says, hey, is it a stackable or is it side by side? I said, it's stackable. Why? Are you going to come help me fix it? We could YouTube this thing. And uh, <laughs> he said, no, a new set's on its way. We took care of it. And every accessory you might need just returns the ones you don't need. Listen, when you tell stories of the people of God caring for the people of God, people see there's something different about the people of God. But you don't get to see the need. You don't get the peace of being provided for or the joy of giving unless you live in community. And we know this city is lonely. We know it can be disconnected. We know it can be hard to connect with people. That's why we as a church try to do life groups to help people connect with other people. So here's the thing. Mitch earlier asked you to fill out a card. Online, there's a way to do this with your host. Some people are gonna come by with some buckets. This is not so you can give more money. We don't do two round offerings around here, okay? It's none of that, hey, good try, everybody, let's go again, none of that. (laughs) Somebody last night put 20 bucks in. I'm pretty concerned, I'm like convinced it was a joke. Uh, We're still grateful, don't get me wrong. Um, The bucket's for the cards that you filled out. Get to a connecting event. What if you sat across the table from your very next best friend in life? The very next one. The community that you've been hungry for. Yeah, they're going to annoy you. Yeah, it's time consuming, but people are the best of our lives. And so inviting people into life. So some buckets are going to go by. If you want to jump in on that connect event, drop the card in. We would love for you to boldly brave that thing because Jesus' people is where we start by sharing with those in need. What does it say to the world, real quick, what does it say to the world when people who bear Jesus' name, who's supposed to be a provider, don't have what they need? It says God doesn't know what he's doing, but here's the thing. As a followers of Jesus, we want to paint this picture always, that those of us in need have what we need. Now let me ask you real quick as we wrap up. Should we only give to people who follow Jesus? Oh man, you need something. Hold on. Do you follow Jesus? Because here's the thing, I don't. (laughs) You're over there. No, that's ridiculous. Are you kidding me right now? That's crazy talk. It's not how God is. That's not what he said. He said, love even your enemy. So what do we do? Who do we share with? That's why around here we say we want to join Jesus and bring life, 
with our generosity to who? Everyone, everywhere, every day. So let's share with anyone, anywhere, any day. He says this in Galatians chapter six, verse 10. Paul says this, he takes what Jesus says one step farther, he says this in verse 10. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to who? Everyone, especially those in the family of faith. Whenever we have the opportunity, so let me just challenge you, be ready. Be ready. Be ready to drop some time. Be ready to drop some money. Be ready to drop some encouraging words because whenever we have the opportunity to be a life bringer, we should step right in with great generosity, expecting nothing in return, counting on our reward in that day. I got this Starbucks I go to all the time and people think I'm addicted to coffee and they're probably right. But the reason I really go is because I just love the people there. Some of the best people on the planet at my Starbucks. Love them. One of them just graduated high school this past year and yesterday left for college. Two days ago, uh, I saw him. He was on his last shift. I'm like, hey, man, when do you leave? He's like, I leave tomorrow. I'm like, no way. I had this idea. I'm like, man, I should have got him a gift. And so I thought of this gift. It's this perfect gift. I would have loved to give it him. But I'm like, oh, it was his last shift. I'm not going to see him again. So then Saturday, I show up. It's the next day. Yes, I'm an addict. And so I show up on Saturday. And I wasn't ready because he walked in to say goodbye to all of his coworkers, literally the moment before he was hitting the interstate down to California for college. And I'm like, no, I missed it again. So I found a way to find out his last name. I'm going to mail it to his college. He's going to be totally creeped out. <laughs> but here's the thing. What if we drop some money in our wallet that was just earmarked for other people, just for whenever that opportunity comes about? What if we gathered some things from around our house that would be better in somebody else's hands and just put them in our car so that at any moment we'd be ready to offer someone something, some a meaning? I got one of my kids for, for one of his birthdays. He wanted to make some homeless packs, just some bags of stuff. So anytime we see somebody homeless, we could hand him something kind. And he's like the homeless pack Nazi. If we don't have it, he's ticked because we're not ready. We we'll all pay the price at that moment. The point is be ready whenever we have the chance. And you never know when it's coming about, so be ready. And finally, we should do this even to our enemies. So here's the question. Jesus says, even to those who not only will not repay us, but may repay us with harm. We even offer to them, because that's exactly what God is like. So here's your action, you ready? Ask God right now. Ask God right now for the opportunity to share this week. Say, God, give me a chance. God, help me see. God, I'll be ready. Have a conversation with him. Ask yourself, who are Jesus' people in need? Maybe you need to march your way over to the compassion thing. Maybe you need to sign up for the group thing, drop it off at Guest Central, I don't know, but find some people, find a way to give to Jesus' people. And then who else do you have a chance to do really good to? A coworker, an employee at a place that you go to all the time, your neighbor, who do you have a chance? Because the best time to say yes to what Jesus has asked us to do is always right now. So let's be people who fix our eyes. And let's be people who share. Would you stand and pray with me? God, life with you is the best. God, make us better and better and better at it. Holy Spirit, in us, because of Jesus' sacrifice for us, Holy Spirit, make us people more and more like you. Shape our hearts, God. We will give our efforts and our actions, God, but you have to do the work. You have to be the one who changes us so that you get all the credit. God, surround us with great friends and good community where we can live together well, hold one another up, and provide when we have and people lack that we could step into the gap. Give us eyes this week to see that, not only in our community of followers of Jesus, but to every single person who might have need. And so, God, we love you. We're counting on you. We know you'll go ahead of us because you're the best. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.